Well, good afternoon. There's a phenomenon that is sweeping the country today. Parents are rising up in state after state to protest critical race theory. It's a racist Marxist ideology that maintains that America is irredeemably racist. And it's aimed at changing our country as we know it. As one parent in California said, I see the agenda being pushed on our children and they're trying to teach our kids to look at each other, not from who they are as a person, but for their skin color. That parent is not alone in their fears. I'm Mike Brownfield. I'm communications director at the Goldwater Institute. And we are excited to host this important conversation today, a time for choosing critical race theory or the American dream. We have with us two experts to help us understand what critical race theory is, how it's spreading in schools, colleges, and corporations and media in all corners of the country, and what we can do about it. We have Jonathan Butcher, who's a senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute, and he's the Will Skillman Fellow in Education at the Heritage Foundation. Jonathan researches and testifies on education policy all across the United States. And he's currently writing a book for Post Hill Press discussing critical race theory in schools and America's national identity. Kevin Jackson is CEO of Seeking Educational Excellence, a nonprofit of the Kevin Jackson Network. Kevin also hosts the Kevin Jackson Show on radio. He's a highly sought after national speaker and a three-time Amazon best-selling author. He's a prolific writer, commentator, and business leader. And Kevin brings a bold and unique perspective on politics and culture today. The Goldwater Institute is incredibly pleased to welcome them here today. Jonathan, I wanna start with you since you're, you're literally writing the book on critical race theory. Six months ago, no one knew what critical race theory was. They hadn't heard about it, yet it's been around for a long time, and it seems like it's exploded into the national consciousness overnight. What, tell us, what is critical race theory? Where, where does it come from? Well, thank you, Mike, and that's a great question. So critical race theory is a theory. It's a worldview, a philosophy. It's a way of seeing public and private life and they are committed, critical race theorists, to looking through everything around us through the lens of race. And so everything can be explained by its comparison or by the perspective of what it means for your skin color and your racial identity. To be very specific, have a look at what it means for K-12 curriculum, which is in the headlines a lot today, because that's where many parents are seeing critical race theory the closest. That's how it's coming home in the backpacks and in homework assignments. So just very quickly, uh, in Portland Public Schools, they have a group called the Critical Race Theory Coalition. And it's a group of teachers that is posting their meetings as recently as April on a YouTube channel. You can watch them discuss critical race theory and how they're applying it to schools. In Loudoun County, Virginia, which is also in the headlines a lot these days, they contracted with a professional development company for teacher training with a company that teaches critical race theory. They say so in their training uh, materials, in their presentations. Not to mention in California, where the state just developed a new ethnic studies curriculum, they have an entire section in this state-sponsored, state-created ethnic studies curriculum about intersectionality. And this is an idea that comes from Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the original critical race theorists from the late 80s and 90s, who still is defending critical race theory today. So we have very specific examples today that we can point to, and this matters because even though, Mike, like you said, perhaps six, nine months ago, few people knew what critical race theory was, certainly not in the general public, today, the media has very quickly moved to a point where they're saying, no, no, it's not really, it's not really there. This is a conspiracy by certain people to stop the teaching of a thorough learning of history, right? That's the argument that we are being fed today. And that's utter nonsense. It's utter nonsense because we can see those using the words critical race theory in classrooms. Kevin, we hear, you know, critical race theory, of course, but what we understand now is that its root is in Marxism, but we don't hear talk of Marxism. Instead, we hear words like equity, inclusion, social justice. Like what, why is it that, you know, like, what is this about from your perspective? And why are we getting these kind of coded terms to describe something that's really quite different? 
Well, to touch on a little bit about what Jonathan was saying, this Marxist ideology is meant to teach that ideology and effectively to say that, you know, it, it, it's a to cop out of the education system. Because instead of teaching kids that you have something to offer, that you have a God-given talent, and it's the responsibility of an educator to find that talent within you, it's a cop-out mentality that says, let's all get along. It's all gonna be equitable. Um, and, and I love that they use the term uh, equitable you know, versus equal. And they make that distinction. But I, as I like to say to people when I'm talking about this, all men can't be Chippendale dancers and all women can't be Victoria's Secrets models. <laughs> so we're all different. We're different. We're born with different intellect. We're born with different circumstances, be it socioeconomic or whatever. I was born uh, with a father who went to prison, to San Quentin prison, and a mother who died before I was at, before I turned five years old. I mean, ultimately, that's what my life, where my life led. And I managed to succeed despite all of these things. So we, we, instead of looking at the circumstances of life, which cover the spectrum for all colors, all genders, and to, to Jonathan's point, all intersections, we wanna focus on certain aspects of society. And part of that, that Marxism is to say, let's divide and conquer. And the best way to divide and conquer America at least what's been what worked back in that in that particular time and right probably rightfully so because we had a lot of racial divide was the idea of race but fast forward to today and there's nothing holding anybody back regardless of their intersection intersectionality regardless of their gender regardless of their sexuality and certainly regardless of their color but color remains that one thing that sort of drives the issue Talk about, so intersectionality, people might have heard that term, but what exactly does that mean? Like, how are people, we're getting sliced and diced into all different kinds of identity groups under identity politics. What, what are those? What's that look like? Well, it's an interesting concept because what it says is that, in theory, the more intersections you have in, in this, um, um, the oppression, if you will. So if you're a Black woman who happens to be short, and maybe had a single, came from a single parent, et cetera. In other words, the more diversity you had in your life, I'm sorry, uh, the more uh, anguish that you've enjoyed in life, the more that you understand life. So if you have all these intersections, you're, maybe you're LGBTQ, so you have something to, to, to understand about that that the non-LGBTQ does not understand. And the more of these points that you have, the more you understand about the world. But if you really dissect it, what it really boils down to is that of the 7.6 billion people in the world, we have 7.6 billion intersectionalities because we're all individuals. And what happens is they wanna make it into a collective when it suits, and then in the case, which is in CRT, but when they also make it into a collective with all of these various groups that have had some sort of disenfranchisement or a problem in dealing with life as a human being. So when you really boil it down to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an attack on the humanity of people to just live their lives as, in, as individuals. Because at the end of the day, I don't think most people care if their dry cleaner is black or gay. Um, pause really quickly, let everybody know at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button and you can submit questions all throughout our conversation. I'll try to work them in and we'll also get to some of your questions at the end of our conversation. Kevin, picking up on your point, you know, we know that Dr. King had a dream. It was to live in a nation where we're not judged by the color of our skin, but the content of our character. But critical race theory teaches the opposite of that. In fact, um, Ibram X. Kendi, who's one of the like anti-racist so-called leaders of the critical race theory movement says that the language of colorblindness is a mask to hide racism. <laughs> so like, take that apart for a minute. So to say, as Dr. King tried to advocate for, it's not about your color, we're, be colorblind. It's about who we are as individuals. But the point of all that, a new leader is telling us is to, is, is to mask and to hide racism. Well, so one of the theories is, is that when people say I'm colorblind, you know, I, I want to live in a colorblind society, the CRT 
proponents say that is, you know, well, you're, you're, you're being disingenuous. And I agree with them to, to a point because in as much as the audience knows that I'm black and you two gentlemen are white, unless Stevie Wonder's watching, uh, you know, they'd all have to be blind not to see that. But what, what we're saying is that you see through that and it goes back to Dr. King's doctrine, and, which is we are judging people by the content of their character, but CRT doesn't wanna believe that. CRT doesn't believe in meritocracy, which is you may not like me at the beginning for whatever reason. Maybe it's a bigoted reason. Maybe it's an absolute racist reason, but I can win you over because if I work hard and I show you that I deserve a seat at the table, you'll see it and you'll give it to me. And I'm gonna tell you, there have been many people of all colors who've experienced this. And I like to, to use Jesse Owens as an example because I say that in 1936, when Jesse Owens was absolutely being oppressed, he still represented America at the Olympics. And when I say represented America, I mean America. He didn't go there to represent black America, even though by default he did. And I want people to understand that in 10.3 seconds when he beat that German in the 100 meter dash, all of America cheered a black man to beat a white man. And so we knew even back then that color was insignificant at our core. There were people back in America who still wanted separate water fountains and separate uh, services for blacks who cheered for Jesse Jackson. And the same can be said for uh, Joe Lewis. So we've already proven this. And then you fast forward to 2008, where we've supposedly came of age enough to elect our first black president or at least noticeably black president. And so we felt like America had proven itself over and over again. So the idea that we're still having this discussion of race, quite frankly, probably perplexes a lot of the people that are watching this particular broadcast. And I know Jonathan's got a lot to say on the subject because we've uh, had a couple of conversations around it. So yeah, Jonathan, um, you know, one aspect or the central aspect of critical race theory is that America is systemically racist at our core and that every race pervades everything. And that lesson of colorblindness or that we all are able to achieve on our merits is not what is being taught to children in our schools, quite the opposite. So what are schools teaching children about the history of our country and how is it so different than what we all, you know, hopefully learned when we were in school? So that's a great question because one of the things that critical theorists say about education today is first, that if you oppose critical race theory, you oppose a thorough retelling of history. Right, and that all that these state bills and these proposals that are out there today that are uh, working to reject critical race theory in the classroom, they're really just an attempt to squash an appropriate telling of history. No one wants that, right? We should be teaching students about slavery. We should be teaching students about redlining and its effects. We should be teaching students about the Jim Crow era, but we should also be teaching them about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We should be teaching them about the civil rights movement and what that did culturally for Americans, right? What has happened since the Civil Rights Act and since the civil rights movement, it didn't erase racism from America, right? Because as humans, it's gonna be a sad part of the life that we live in. But what it means is that now both culturally and institutionally, we reject the idea of racism, we reject discrimination. And we can do that and know that the government won't endorse it and that both public and private life, there is no place for discrimination today. So that's why when we hear reports say in Illinois of the teacher who now has filed a lawsuit because they, uh, the school used affinity groups for their students where they broke them up according to race, their skin color, and provided different resources to those students for different school activities. Not to mention in Iowa City, Iowa, they have a whole lesson plan on white fragility or this essence of whiteness as though it's something that should levy guilt on top of people for things that they had nothing personally that they were involved in before. I think some of the points that Kevin has made have been so important for us to recognize today because Ibram X. Kendi's idea here that we can only fix future, fix future discrimination with present dis discrimination or the flip, right? We can only fix present discrimination with future discrimination or that um, the comments that America is systemically racist, they were said before 
This is what Derek Bell, the godfather of critical race theory, said in the 1980s, right? He said that uh, in the past, white people only allowed civil rights progress to happen to maintain their power. And this gets to the root of critical race theory. Critical race theory is about different tribes competing for power in whatever landscape that they are in. Well, and so other, as you trace point. the roots back, yeah. One other quick point about Derrick Bell, he also made the comment that Blacks who were successful in America were passing as whites, as if there's some sort of a quality of white versus Black. And, and we touched on it earlier that meritocracy LeBron James is one of the best basketball players ever, not because some white man is allowing him to be that. He's that because he worked very hard. Tiger Woods, everybody is chronicled. Why is Tiger Woods, I believe, one of the, the best golfer ever, but certainly can be mentioned as one of the best without question. It isn't because some white person helped him. Helped him. Jack Nicholson didn't just give him that title. Tiger had to earn it. And so this idea that black folks are passing is patently ridiculous and it's insulting because when you and, and by the way even when you have this discussion with critical race theorists and i talked to one and she, her father was an engineer and she was an attorney and and she confided in me that she feels like when she walks in a room she has to rationalize because she's black that she earned her degree and that she was worthy of getting into yale and getting her her uh, her uh, jd degree and I, I feel much the same when I was in, I, I have a double E degree with computer science and math degrees as well. And when I was designing supercomputers, you, you feel as if you've got to sort of overcome this notion of being an affirmative action uh, kid or affirmative action engineer or affirmative action doctor or lawyer or accountant. And it shouldn't be that way. When you look at a graduate, you should look at that person based on what is it? The content of their character, which in this case means their grades and their ability to do the job, but we're not doing that. And the people that Jonathan is mentioning, Mercusa and, and Derek Bell are, are the people that are propagating these lies that quite frankly make people look at people differently. And I think that's the problem. Well, that's another what diversity. Sorry, I was going to say, Mike, just very quickly, that's one of the, the dangers with intersectionality is because the focus is so much on all the different ways that we are oppressed in all the, the ways that um, you are talking about from gender to race and beyond, right? You're, um, as you inject that into schools, both through curriculum as well as diversity trainings, uh, what you do is build resentment and those that participate in those. And research shows that. In fact, there are hundreds of studies that have been documented, documented that show that diversity trainings do not work and they actually do create resentment among the participants. And this is something that both media on the right and the left uh, have brought up, that diversity trainings have widely been found to be failures. And, uh, and yet this is one of the ways that critical theory is pushed into schools. Jonathan, I want to pick up on another lesson plan, and that's um, something that's 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 put forth by the Black Lives Matter movement, and it's called "It Comes to Us Through Black Lives Matter Week of Action." And if our listeners um, don't realize, Black Lives Matter and critical race theory are very intimately intertwined. But what tell us about some of the things that we're taught about whiteness and blackness and the different values um, of the of the respective races in that Black Lives Matter week of action. So remember that when critical theory first came out of Germany in the 1920s, when um, uh, Max Horkheimer gave his big speech in 1937, when he was installed as the director of what became known as the Frankfurt School, he said specifically that he wanted critical theory to impact culture. That's what they were after, even though he was a Marxist. And even though he was most concerned with the oppressor, oppressed distinction among the uh, uh, economic classes, right? The burgessy and the proletariat and all of that, culture was what they were going after. And the Black Lives Matter movement has, uh, is, is living that out. And in their week of action, they have a set of principles. Among those is that they want to disrupt the nuclear prescribed, what they call the Western prescribed nuclear family. So they are after what they say is a cultural institution that they want to destroy, right? So every time that you hear, right, that critical race theory is trying to bring us tolerance or is trying to bring us to some sort of cultural understanding, just remember it's their definition 
of what they think is appropriate, because it's certainly not the Western prescribed nuclear family. The same goes for ideas like mathematics. There's a lesson that was in the uh, Black Lives Matter curriculum, which they recommended to schools around the country that teaches about how uh, money is a oppressive uh, lesson. When you teach students about money, it's all about the race of the, the men who are on the dollar bills, right? And you can even go beyond that. And we should really be wondering if the issue with critical race theory in schools is that critical race theorists want history to be taught thoroughly, then why are they interested in math? Because Gloria Ladson Billings, one of the most prominent critical race theorists today in colleges of education, was the keynote speaker for the National Association of, of Mathematics Teachers in 2019. In science, in the National Association of Science Teachers, they had a recent webinar around the country. Their keynote speaker was a critical race theorist. So this can, you can hardly, right, be uh, uh, under the guise anymore that this is just about talking about history. This is trying to change culture. It's trying to inject into all of the subjects, right? This perspective that, as Kevin described, is clearly discriminatory. Well, the problem is it's not trying to change culture. It is changing culture. Uh, you look at what happened. There was a gentleman that was reading a book. I believe it was called Notre Dame versus the Klan. And he got suspended for quite a while because a black lady passed by and thought he was interested in the Klan. Well, it was Notre Dame versus the Klan. That's what the book was about. So you, even just seeing that book was enough to get him a suspension. Where we're headed here is that if you are a white person working in America and you're even accused of not being woke enough. And so let's say somebody just decides that they accuse you of having used the N word. Look at Paula Dean. She was asked about something that happened to her year, decades before. She answered honestly that her Southern roots, she'd heard the word, used the word. She lost a career for over 11 years. And this is going to become the norm because critical race theory and all these tenets are not about to, to creep into American culture. They are here. And it's become so pervasive that finally the alarm bell has gone off, I believe, to enough people to where they said, wait a minute, we are not racist. Uh, the, we are probably looking at the most interracial group of people in decades. When I was growing up, you could count on your hands the number of interracial couples you knew probably all over the country. And this included celebrities. Nowadays, who's not interracial? And, and, and let's be frank, if we run our, our DNA, run an Ancestry.com or 23andMe, you two guys aren't as white as you think you are. And I can, can attest, I'm 21% white and 79% sub-Saharan African. So we're not all of anything anymore. And we, we, a long time ago, should have abandoned this. So again, I asked the question, why are we still talking about this when we have more than anecdotal evidence of Black people being successful? You can't say that the litany of Blacks we could all name, and, and many people in this audience could name for hours, who are very successful in their own right. And I'm not just talking about celebrities, I'm talking about your accountant, your doctor, your uh, vet and people like that who are people of color, LGBT, et cetera. How are we still focused on this when it's not anecdotal, the success of all of these intersecting uh, you know, beings or, or, or issues? How is it that we are so uh, profoundly successful in America, but we're still dealing with these issues? And it's a very simple answer, it's money. I want to pause to remind everybody that you can ask questions of our panelists with the Q&A box on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, we have a, a great question here from Tim who asks, um, how do parents and school administrators ensure teachers do not skew or insert their own bias into lessons? And Jonathan, I'd love for you to talk about that, like what are the policy solutions that are out there? So I think there are a couple. I mean, one, of course, is from uh, the Goldwater Institute. Uh, Matt Beinberg has done a tremendous job uh, working around the country talking about the need to have transparency over school curriculum. Uh, we need for parents to be able to see what their children are learning, what the textbooks are, what the lesson plans are, so they don't have to learn about it later when it's in a headline, right? So in Texas, Governor Abbott actually had said, uh, that he was highly critical. I think he might've even said that a teacher should have been fired for a comic strip that an eighth grade teacher put in a history lesson. But nobody had known that that was there until it was too late, right? Imagine if people had known beforehand 
uh, what that teacher was trying to do because it's rarely just one instance, right? If this is their perspective, surely they had been doing other things in the classroom and parents should be able to know in this age of sort of post COVID where every child at some point over the past year was online and all of the content was being delivered online, there's no excuse for districts to say that they can't make this material available. So that's that's a big first step. And the second one uh, that I would say is we must be concerned with two big issues. The first is compelled speech and saying that no teacher or student should be compelled to say, believe, affirm any idea that violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so this goes with the affinity groups. This goes with the idea that one race is superior than another, or this goes with the idea that certain individuals should receive benefits or sanctions because of the color of their skin, all of which are happening in school policies today. So I think there are ways that lawmakers can do this. They should protect the exchange of ideas. Again, we should have a thorough retelling of American history. Race is an important issue in the American experience in America's past, but that doesn't give us an excuse today to suddenly say, that we have to relive the civil rights movement again right. and somehow have all of these hard lessons about how casting guilt on people because of the color of their skin is the wrong way for us to build a culture. Well, let me make a couple of comments about what uh, Jonathan said. First of all, let me say this. The Olympics is about to happen in Japan and America will have the most diverse group of people standing on those platforms of any country in the world. China is not gonna have any black people standing on the podium. So think about that as you consider what we're even talking about here. A couple of other things legislatively and great plug for Goldwater. We're certainly glad to be a part of academic transparency legislation as well with our team. But school boards need to be changed. We need to start looking at the power of the school board and getting parents involved and understanding that even though that it, that's the largest elected body of individuals in the country, the single body, they control the level of indoctrination or education that your kid gets. Since the Department of Education started in 79, we've seen the outcome. Kids are getting dumber. We're pouring more money into the school system and kids are getting dumb. This, the next thing I would say, and this is more of my own personal thing, is that we have to stop teaching that making everything easy. I grew up in a relatively difficult life. I lost my mother before I turned five. My father was in San Quentin prison. And what it did, having that diversity strengthened me. I, my brother and I live with my grandparents and my grandparents put instilled in us a confidence that said, you're gonna have to be better. Your life has already been giving you lemons and you're gonna need to learn how to make lemonade or squeeze the, the juice in the eye of an enemy. So we were taught to go after life with all the gusto we could. And we, we were never told that that adversity that was occurring in our lives was bad necessarily. It was just the hand you got dealt. I will tell you this, and I believe the audience will back me with this. The majority of things you learn, you learn through the tough times. You don't learn much when you got a full belly. So it's good to feel a hunger pain. But what, what, ha what has happened over the years is government has replaced that. It says, eat a little bit of food. I'm never going to give you caviar and steak, but I'll give you some government cheese and I'll let you never feel hunger. Well, you need to feel hunger. So we need to stop teaching kids that the easy way out is the way to go. You know, every now and then you need to get a brutal slap of life. And even Van Jones said it to these college kids. He says, you're going to leave this safety of academia. You're going to cross over the concrete into the concrete jungle of the world that is not going to cut you any slack. So how about we get away from all these other things and we start teaching kids critical thinking and the true survival skills of life and we're gonna be a lot better. But as, as I said earlier, these are excuses for academia. One of the truly institutional racist things that we can talk about that's been occurring for decades and nobody wants to even address that level of institutional racism where 60% of black kids who get into college at a seventh grade reading level, by the way, don't even finish and then carry the most debt once they graduate. So if they wanna have these discussions about institutional racism, let's begin with academia. Yeah, and didn't Van Jones say, he's not gonna pave the jungle for you, right? Put on your That's boots. That's exactly right, they're there, not gonna it? pave it. Thank you for the, <laughs> leave it to Jonathan yeah. to correct me. <laughs> Jonathan, we have a, a question from one of our attendees. Can you 
hone in, focus in a little bit more on what exactly critical race theory teaching looks like, because I think it's important for people to understand that it's not exactly like teachers aren't sitting down and saying, here is a theory we want you to learn. It's, it is an entirely different set of ideals. And what, what, is that, what does that look like in a classroom? Yeah, that's a great question because you're unlikely to have an elementary school teacher, or even a high school teacher talk about Max Horkheimer, right? Or Herbert Marcuse, uh, or even mention Derek Bell's name, okay? So you'll see a couple of, of code words. So one is diversity, equity, and inclusion all of which sound uh, pretty benign, right? And we've, you know, those are things that you normally wouldn't, wouldn't disagree with. Uh, the same goes with culturally responsive learning or culturally responsive material. Um, those are commonly used words to describe what's happening. But here are some examples of how that's applied, all right? So let's take the culturally responsive uh, curriculum. The Washington DC public school uh, district has on their website some teacher training materials. And one of them is a chart that teachers are supposed to use to look at all the textbooks that their school uses and mark the race of every author on that chart and count the races of all of those authors. So not which textbooks are most effective or have been most successful in the past at teaching students math or science or anything else, just the race of those authors, right? That's what they call culturally responsive. This lends itself, quick departure here, to one of the things that goes with critical race theory is that they are interested in measuring uh, equal, uh, equity of outcomes. They don't really care how you get there. It just matters that everybody arrives at the same place, right? It's very different than equality under the law or equality of opportunity. They're saying they wanna push everybody to the same spot, which means some people have to be pressed down, some people have to be pushed up, all right? Okay, so culturally responsive learning, we've got that side. On the diversity, equity, and inclusion side, some of this comes from the diversity trainings that I was talking about before, where students are asked to assume or admit or confess some sort of guilt or something about what uh, their ethnicity, right? So an example from California's ethnic studies curriculum are these um, land acknowledgement posters that the state says students should make. So one of the exercises is you create a land acknowledgement poster saying that the land that you are on was stolen. And the implication is that you were part of the stealing of that, right? So it's impressing on you this idea that America is not a shared sense of uh, national character or identity that belongs to all of us, but that we are all guilty of something, right? Uh, I think a lot of the work of uh, Robin D'Angelo goes, pushes very hard on this issue. Robin D'Angelo is a, a diversity trainer who wrote the book White Fragility, which few people had heard of when it came out in 2018, but uh, now it has uh, increasing popularity. Her book, it drives this idea uh, that all uh, white people are guilty. And, and there is, again, another phrase you'll hear a lot is unconscious bias. And so there are things that we do that we simply can't control. We're just wrong because of our, our ethnicity, because of our skin color. Kevin, you kind of touched on this point. And here's another question from the audience. How do we teach Americans that Marxism is bad and dangerous or that critical race theory um, is, is a bad way of thinking about our country? Yeah, I think that when we start getting into the isms, you know, Marxism, communism, socialism, and things like that, we tend to lose people. It's kind of like, if you want to talk about the Bible, don't go all Philippians 4.13 on people. You really have to sort of live it. And America has lived it. Uh, I, I, I use the example quite often, and this has to do with cultural appropriation, which I find fascinating, because everything's appropriated. You know, at some point, you, you make somebody make something and another person says, I think I can make it better. And it's improved upon. And while we're doing it here in the States, somebody in China or Japan or Germany is making something similar. And what we find out is that we are like human beings. We think alike. And so anyway, this kid is in college and he's, uh, he's got braids. He's a white kid and he's going up the stairs and a black lady, a black girl, student stops him and says, why, you know, who are you to culturally appropriate my hairstyle? And this kid was completely taken aback because he doesn't understand what she's talking about. He likes dreads. In, in as much as, you know, if your black guy wants to wear a mullet, he could, uh, we might get laughed at amongst our peers, but he could do it. But what he should have said is, who are you to talk to me in your culturally appropriated language? 
Now that would have stopped her cold. And what, it, what, it, what I'm getting at is we have to learn how to think as well. Americans are not racist by nature. I know that's a shock to a lot of people, but white people do not go around thinking about, you know, other people's color. I've been to many parties and honestly, I have to look around the room over time and it'll generally be some friend of mine that'll, you know, that'll joke that, hey, Kevin, you're the only black guy here. I don't even think about it. And I think most of America doesn't. I don't believe anybody watching us now is planning to go to the grocery store and wondering what the ethnic makeup is of what's going to be in the, in the fruits and vegetable aisle or what the checker is going to be. So we've got this, this fomented, completely trumped up idea that America is obsessed with race when it's quite the contrary. So I believe that in terms of us dealing with it, we have to start pushing back and letting people know that we're not going to be caught. People are going to call you what they call you, but you don't have to accept it. Mike, I was going to say, if I can just add to Kevin's point very quickly, uh, because uh, um, uh, Ibram Kendi says that capitalism and racism are conjoined twins. So make no mistakes that Marxism is very much at the root here. And you don't have to go back too far. At the very beginning of critical race theory, uh, Angela Harris said that uh, uh, something, or she, she said, Marx's dazzling analysis of capitalism uh, is something that invigorates critical theorists all over, right? So you don't have to scratch the surface too much to recognize that because capitalism relies on meritocracy, which Kevin has already described, is so important to our shared sense of what it means to be an American. By rejecting that, you immediately, right, have this alternative of Marxism, which ostensibly says that you can artificially push everyone to the same place. So, you know, I wouldn't, as we talk to people about what critical race theory is, and as we explain what the dangers are, you don't have to lead with Marxism, right? You don't have to lead with uh, something that may get you dismissed right away, but you can't get all the way to the end of this crazy trail without touching up against what is very much an attack on the way of life that has made it possible for people, no matter their background, to be successful, even amidst the worst of times, whether it was the Jim Crow era, slavery, or even before. And Jonathan's right about that, but I want to make one other final point on this, maybe. I don't know if we'll have more discussion, but Look at the Black Lives Matter leader, Patrice Colors Cohen, uh, Con, Con Colors, I'm sorry, who owned millions of dollars of homes. Now she's an avowed Marxist. I don't have to bring up her Marxism. What I can bring up is her hypocrisy because she wants to profess to be down with blacks and she's you know, trying to, to present herself as somebody who's wanting to bring everybody to a level. And she's living in a almost exclusively white enclave in one of her homes. And she's got millions of dollars of property that she wouldn't have had otherwise had she not been selling this lie. So those are the examples you wanna push back on people. LeBron James, Ka Kaepernick took a knee because he wanted a better contract not because he cared about black folks and what was really happening with policing in America, because if he looked at the statistics, he would know that everything he espouses is a lie. So when you can come back to them with real life evidence that will come from groups like Heritage and groups like Goldwater and the other think tanks and people listening to people like myself and others, because believe me, it's a small minority of blacks who believe in CRT. The majority of American blacks do not buy into this nonsense. It infantilizes black people and it demoralizes white people. And to even be presenting this is a violation of everything that America stands for. I'm so sorry. here's a problem in trying to attack this. And this is something to expose about critical race theory that people may not realize and they'll be shocked by, is that critical race theorists do not value the principles of like free speech, for example. The freedom of speech is less important than the freedom to not be hurt by ugly words. And if your if your words do not comport with their you know their sort of approved rhetoric, you risk being canceled. And we're seeing this on college campuses. And Jonathan, you know, I would love it if you would talk about how free speech, just as one example, um, is something that's under assault and why. Well, it just seems so foreign to me that anybody would be against such a fundamental precept of America, um, the freedom of speech, and they, they'd be happy to limit it or do away with it. 
So uh, an example that made the headlines in recent years was Evergreen State uh, College up in Washington State. And there you had a professor who described himself as progressive, said he voted for Bernie Sanders, said that uh, he disagreed with uh, what was sort of an unofficial policy for a day that all of the white individuals on campus were not allowed back on campus. And he disagreed. His class shouted him down, chased him off campus, and eventually he had to go into hiding. And so uh, he was you know, profiled in the New York Times. He wrote op-eds in the Wall Street Journal. And what many people may not realize is that shortly before all of this happened, Evergreen had as a keynote speaker, no less than Robin DiAngelo come and speak about race at that university. And there's a three-part documentary series that was produced just a couple of years ago that traces the origin of this very toxic perspective on race that enveloped the campus. Eventually, the campus was overrun by violent students in uh, 2017. They had to postpone graduation. Uh, they had a steep drop in enrollment months after all of this occurred. And once you trace the free speech origins back to this deep seated issue of uh, an unhealthy perspective on race in the United States, you see that they're connected. And then now we can talk about Herbert Marcuse, one of the original critical theorists who wrote in an essay called Tolerance that actually we should take away the rights of some people. The only way to create a tolerant society is to take rights from some people and to give more rights to others. And again, this is one of the many inconsistencies in critical race theory, right? They say that there aren't enough rights in the United States today, it's systemically racist. So we have to take away the rights from some and only allow them uh, to go to others. The but same the thing goes, Go ahead, Kevin, go ahead. I was just gonna say the biggest inconsistency is that the people who espouse taking away the rights of others and giving them away are the ones who don't wanna give up their own rights. I mean, the number of, of CRT uh, proponents that I've spoken with who are pretty well healed, certainly probably have more money in the bank than I do. I've never seen one of them decide to write me a check, say, Kevin, I'll take care of the mortgage on your home, you know, as, as an example of what I'm going, willing to give back. I've never seen one give up a job or anything else. So it's what it is, is it's critical race theory. It's not critical race practice because they're never going to practice it because to do so means they have to give up the power that they incidentally want to keep by pretending to be willing to give it up. So, but if you ever were to say, if you believe in critical race theory, we're going to put your money, you put your money where your mouth is and whoever you meet, if you have to give up whatever you have that is in excess, you will find out it will die on the vine. Jonathan, with the speech on free speech on college campuses, what is your, here's another plug for a Goldwater Institute, but talk about, you know, Goldwater, and this is a plan that you've worked on. How can we go about restoring free speech on college campuses and really protect the freedom of speech and the bastion of what should be free speech and dialogue? Well, I think there are a couple of legislative ideas that are important proposals for lawmakers to consider today. So the first is that if uh, the system was working in public institutions the way it should, that public university administrators should be the ones that should be making sure that everyone had the right to listen and be heard on campus. But if they're not going to, then it's going to go to the boards of regents or the boards of trustees, right? The governing boards of these institutions. If they don't do it and set the policies, then it will have to be state lawmakers who understand what proposals need to be considered. They should have a couple of parts to them. So for one, on a public university campus, everyone should have the right to listen and be heard. Second, these speech codes of free speech zones, bias response teams, um, all should all are an, an anathema to what should be a, a place of open discussion, right? We should be talking about the difficult issues. As the Chicago statement on free speech said several years ago, it's not a school's responsibility to protect students or professors from ideas with which they disagree. So this doesn't mean that we're somehow policing what professors are saying in the classroom. We're saying that they should be able to maintain order in the classroom. But once you're on the sidewalk, you should be free to express yourself right up to the point that you don't interfere with someone else who's trying to do the same. And I think what the Institute brought uh, to this discussion is the idea that if you have a student who multiple times violates someone else's right to listen or be heard, the university must consider 
suspension or expulsion for that student. It is not right to simply allow that student to continue to block someone else's expressive behavior. And so this is very important. And I would just add, and this is a bit of a plug for um, the book that Mike mentioned earlier that I'm working on. If we want to know what things are going to look like in the K-12 space in the coming years, all you have to do is look at universities and what the free speech climate is on campus yep. today, right? Bias response teams are actually being used by, by public school districts today in Boston for example, in Loudoun County, for example, these were the very same bias response teams that at the University of Michigan, the Department of Justice intervened and a court ruled are unconstitutional and silenced speech. So all of these same things that we've seen on college campuses, we're going to be seeing it trickle down into the K-12 space. And that should, that should make everyone concerned, right? That should, that should worry all of us. I understand that the jurisprudence is difference between speech in K-12 schools and universities, but these same speech codes and violations of expressive behavior are, are happening in colleges. They're gonna be moving down into the K-12 space as well. Well, and they're not just gonna be in K-12. And by the way, I, I applaud Goldwater for going after this at the legislative level for colleges. It's a shame that you have to do it, but they're not gonna change on their own. Uh, when I was getting my fellowship, I uh, went into a, a professor's class in order to sell my class. And he said to me, point blank, if I had known you were a conservative, I wouldn't have let you in my class. And I told the students, I said, well, that's the difference between us. I'm open to all discussion. See, they don't want that to be heard. So I think that you're, you're on the right track and Goldwater's done an amazing job, both with academic transparency, getting parents to pay attention. I think COVID helped a lot with the uh, the distance learning and it forced parents to, to see things that were going on. Teachers were forced to really bite their tongues on some of the things that they were teaching. So I think that, you know, that exposure helped quite a bit. But these types of panel discussions, I think, are going to wake the public up to what's going on. The, the, there is no way you can look at critical race theory and see what's being taught, that you can look at Black Lives Matter. What's interesting about all of the things that we're going to talk about that we've been talking about, but look at the, the idea of Black Lives Matter, Black entertainment television, Black, uh, the, the idea at Evergreen College, they wanted all the white kids off of a campus, switch any of those to white, and we know what we get. We would get outrage. Well, if it's outrage for one color or one intersection, it should be outrage for everybody. And that's what we've got to get out to people. And, and I believe in my heart that this is one of the first issues uh, post Trump's uh, you know, losing the election is that it's finally awakened, awakened people to the point where they say, this doesn't have the American feel to it and they're getting it. And they, they can sense the undertones of Marxism and socialism here. And discrimination. And I think, you know, for those that are worried that we're somehow silencing what's taught in classrooms or that, you know, any of the work to deal with critical race theory is somehow censorship, Look, it's flat discrimination, and we should all be ready to agree that that has no place, right? That has no place in America. And so, and if it's racially discriminatory, we should be able to identify it for what it is and say uh, that this doesn't belong in a classroom, and it certainly doesn't belong uh, in our culture. Well, I want to make one other point. When I was in the 11th grade, I believe, I found a, a Black history book, and I felt like Lord of the Rings, and I had my precious. Uh, I had no clue that blacks had that level of contribution because you learn history that's taught in regular history books. So I see the point of what they're trying to say, but here's what, it, what Black History Month and all these other things that we've sort of catered to the black community to say, hey guys, there's more history out there for you. I would say this, the average American only wants to escape history in high school. They're not into it. <laughs> They, they, they're in it to get a basic understanding of history and to get the grade. But if you happen to be Ukrainian, or if you happen to be Chinese, or you happen to be um, Hispanic, Latino, whatever, and you want to learn about your culture, there are books out there. The internet is an amazing place for us to learn more about our culture. Now, for me, it was get, getting that book. And I actually stole that book from our, our library temporarily and put it back at the end of the year, but because I, I was a, a sponge for understanding black history. So I understand the angst and learning it, but I wanna to touch on one other earlier point that learning about slavery and the lack of civil rights and things like that in conjunction with what I learned about black history made me feel more empowered 
as an American, the idea that this country made the adjustment to take black people from slavery and, and chattel to, to being completely part of the fabric of this country. And I saw it as something to be proud of not to look back on and say, this is a bad thing. What CRT is doing is it's wanting to pick open a wound that's well healed. And that, heal, that wound has been healed for decades and proven itself out time and time again. So we can't allow that to happen because America is not anything close to what these people describe. I saw a poll um, the other day that says that among um, Americans, there's a fear of speaking about sensitive issues, especially race. And, and that fear is across, that's across parties, 52% of liberals, 64% of moderates, and 77% of conservatives. And that's a, a fear, that's a, a poll coming out of Gallup. How do you overcome that? I mean, these are tough things to talk about. I don't know if Jonathan wants to chime in, but I, I'll tell you this. It, whenever you feel that you, you, when you self silence, you've lost a battle. Uh, look, you're going to get accused of being, if you don't believe in CRT, you're called a racist. When in fact, if you believe in CRT, you are the racist. So if you're not willing to espouse that, to say what it is and suffer the consequences, so be it. I got kicked off of Twitter because I challenged Jack Dorsey regarding how the uh, officer Signet got killed. I said the New York Times was wrong. They said he was killed with a fire extinguisher to the head and he was pepper sprayed when he died of a stroke. Are you gonna consider them fake news? And they kicked me off of Twitter. Now, my, my team relied on Twitter for social media. I'm not on there, but I don't care. And when we finally get to the point where we go away from these things and we're starting to do it, we're, we've gone away from media, we're going away from social media. I think there's probably more homeschooling that happened in the last year than at any time in American history. And it's continuing. And I don't know where that evolution is going to end up, but you can see that shift. And if that shift continues, if we start standing up for the people that want to promote intersectionality, they want to promote an LGBT agenda over a human agenda. I've said to many of the LGBT community, I find it appalling that you want me to recognize you for your sexuality versus your humanity. You know, I can't do that. I'm gonna recognize you for your humanity back to what, John, what you said earlier, Mike, the content of your character. And I don't care about the other things. That's between you and God or you and whatever higher power, if you have, believe in one that you wanna take that to. But I think the majority of us believe this. And, and if you're going to silence yourself on the tough issues, then don't expect that it's going to improve. And we've got to be ready to call it for what it is. Ahead, Jonathan, I'm sorry. I, I mean, just gonna, we have to be ready to call it for what it is. It's discriminatory. I mean, it's prejudice. And so we have to recognize that affinity groupings, uh, levying guilt based on your ethnicity, um, separating students and asking them to complete a whiteness scale. I mean, all of these things that we hear from school board meetings or that we've heard are happening in classrooms, we've got to be ready to call it prejudice. And that, that then I think should take some of the, uh, some of the hesitancy away about arguing over, is this really a you know, race? No, this is, this is about prejudice. And we should right, recognize um, why that is interfering with our, you know, our neighbors, our communities, our churches, our school board meetings, you know, um, all of the ways in which we form communities. Kevin, there's a question directed directly at you. And I think it's an important part of this conversation. The question is, do you really think things are healed in America? And before I have you answer that, um, you know, so much of this is we are acknowledging that America is by no means perfect, but there's, there's opportunity to, to change and improve. And it's just a different view of what our country is about. But Kevin, throwing that to you. Well, I'm going to throw it back this way. We're the only country dealing with the nonsense of race. Uh, we'll, you'll hear the term, um, uh, white America is afraid of America being browned. Okay, America has been browned for decades. The Hispanic culture, black culture, Asian culture, whether it be Indian or in, and in many cases, uh, Islamic culture has been uh, forefront. White people aren't even the majority in America. But here's what you'll never hear. You'll never hear about the lightning of any country in Africa. Nobody will bring this up. Somalia is pretty homogeneous and I don't think that anybody's going to accuse them of not having enough white people. 
So just I want you to just think about that for a second and ask yourself, why are we held to some fictitious standard that other countries that are much more homogeneous in nature are held to? And you could you could apply that to climate change. You could apply to the, the treatment of women. You could apply to the to all types of these intersectional issues that we deal with every day. And America is held to a standard. We've got the cleanest air, but we still must talk about climate change as if we have the dirtiest air. We have the most diverse country, going back to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have all three of those more than any other country in the world. Ask if that question is being discussed in China. Ask if that question is being discussed in any of the 52 countries in Africa. And the answer is no. So look, America has to wake up and stop creating problems where there are no problems. We have long been past the idea of racism in this country. In five short decades that I've been around, I'm gonna tell you, as I mentioned earlier, interracial marriage, inter you could be, you could have been hung in the 1950s for trying to date a white woman as a black man or or even being accused of looking at one and we've gone to where hardly you look around and you see interracial couples on all of the political scale you see kids playing together there's a video circulating right now of a little black kid he goes over to a 90 year old woman's house every day and her, his her, her, the son says sees a little boy and says why are you here he goes i just want to make sure she's okay that is America. And what we do is we allow this noise to come in through this critical race theory, 1619, Black Lives Matter, and all the other racist idiot ideas that come up. And we allow that to be the loudest voice that we hear. Is America racist? No. Do we have elements of racism? Of course. But I will tell you this, there's more racism around the world than there is in this country. And, and you could put our racism, it wouldn't even be a, a toenail clipping compared to how great this country is to people of all intersections using that terminology. Jonathan, we have a question from a parent who's concerned. Is CRT being taught in Arizona right now? How can I know if they're teaching it to my kids in fifth and sixth grade? And to broaden that question, for people who are concerned about this, what can they do? What agency do they have? So I think for starters in a state like Arizona, you do have options. Uh, the huge charter school networks that are all over the state, not to mention uh, the nation's oldest education savings account program, uh, as well as private school scholarships that parents can take advantage of. Uh, certainly uh, one of the nation's 50 homeschool laws. Every state has a homeschool law. Um, so that's a, a big first step is being able to make a choice for your child about what is in their best interest and what's in their needs. Um, I think uh, there have been reports of the 1619 project being used in Arizona schools. Um, I think that it's uh, important for parents to be ready to be active and be engaged, right? If you uh, recognize whether you need to write a letter uh, to the editor, if you're concerned about what's happening in your child's school, go to the school board meeting, talk to your child's teacher, talk to their principal. And again, look in your child's backpack, see what's coming home in the form of homework and look for those key words, right? Again, diversity, equity, inclusion on their own are not bad things, but they are being used today to cover up these, all of these discriminatory ideas that we've been talking about here. Well, Jonathan, thank you for that. And Kevin, thank you so much for your time and joining us. We're at the end of our time today. Um, this has been an awesome conversation and there's a lot more to come. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested in learning more, visit goldwaterinstitute.org slash critical race theory. Um, we'll be doing more work on this subject. We'll be having additional webinars to come on all sorts of subjects, not just uh, not limited to critical, critical race theory. So stay tuned. Um, and another point I'd like to make is that, you know, the work that we do at Goldwater to, you know, push back against critical race theory, but also to defend and expand all of our freedoms, it's made possible by people like you who support us. And if you're interested in supporting our work, you can visit goldwaterinstitute.org slash donate. So Kevin and Jonathan, a big thank you again. And we hope to see all of you who are participating today at our next event. Thank you. Thank you.